Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Bordeaux Show, an ongoing exploration of the famed region and its wines. I'm Ron Edwards, Master Sommelier and Director of Wine Education here at Winebow. And uh, for this uh, webinar series, I'm riding shotgun because this is TJ's journey. We invite you to place any questions or comments in the Q&A as we will not be managing the chat window. Let me introduce you to your host, certified Bordeaux educator, TJ Griffin. TJ has held many jobs within the wine industry from hospitality to wholesale. Throughout his career, what he most enjoyed was learning about wine and sharing that knowledge with others. As the corporate wine educator for Winebow, he now enjoys the privilege of doing what he loves full time. And now here to discuss today's topic, the Appalachian and the trade. Hey, TJ, welcome. Hey, Ron. Just doing a little Groundhog Day reference here. <laughs> I believe that Punxsutawney Phil uh, saw his shadow, which means... Oh, is today, today is Groundhog Day? Today is Groundhog Day, officially. Oh. Well, that explains why I woke up this morning feeling like I was going to do the same thing today as yesterday. <laughs> Same thing every day. Try uh, to take over the world. That's my theory. So Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow and scurried back in his hole. So that means six more weeks of red wine. No, there you go. Yeah, because, uh, you know, winter and red wine go together. But uh, Staten Island Chuck, who's been more accurate than Punxsutawney Phil, didn't see his shadow. So that means maybe we can switch to white Bordeaux sooner than we thought. We'll Maybe. See. Yeah, it's hard to see your shadow when you're covered in 18 inches of snow. <laughs> that could have something to do with it, yes. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? All right. So today we're going to cover uh, just a brief overview of the Appalachian of Bordeaux, like how big it is, uh, what's it comprised of, how does it uh, compare in size to other Appalachians in France, um, some of the production numbers. And we're going to Again, brief, because we could spend a long time on this, just the, the trade structure, a little bit of how that's set up, how it works. Um, in future episodes, we'll probably dive a lot deeper into the trade uh, because it's, it's complex and it's important, of course, to Bordeaux, um, more than most regions, I would say. So any questions, please just stop me and we will discuss them. And if I don't know the answer, I'll make one up or I'll just ask you, Ron. Uh, yeah, and if I don't know the answer, I'll make one up. And before the, before the end of time, they'll realize that we actually don't know all that. Much. All right, let's, well, let's get started. There are no questions at the moment other than um, things like, why are you making uh, Groundhog Day jokes? And on we go. All right. So not surprisingly, Bordeaux is the largest AOC in France. The AOC, we'll, we'll define that in a few slides, but uh, it's, it's big. It's big both in terms of its vineyard area and in terms of its production. Um, in 2019, I couldn't find production numbers yet for 2020. I'm sure they'll be released soon. But in 2019, there was about 111,000 hectares of vineyards, which is a lot, and more than 486 million liters of wine, mostly red, were produced. And that is about 15% of France's total wine production is just from Bordeaux. Interestingly, 1.5% uh, of the entire world's wine is Bordeaux. So that's, that's amazing that just this one appellation could produce that much wine. So this is a fun slide. This is not meant to be completely geographically accurate. So please don't hold me to it if it's if the latitude's a little bit off. But this just shows the relative size in terms of vineyard area to other Appalachians. So the next biggest Appalachian after Bordeaux in France is the Rhone Valley. And Bordeaux is 1.6 times the size of that. It's 2.4 times the size of the Loire Valley. It's three and a half times the Languedoc, 4.3 times Burgundy. Uh, it goes on and on. It's 10 times the size of Alsace. So just just a gigantic Appalachian in terms of production. I think I read somewhere at one point that land mass wise, it covers the same amount of vineyard territory as all of Languedoc Roussillon, but because of the density of planting, the volume is tremendously higher. And uh, this sort of explains why when you go around the world, you can find Bordeaux everywhere. It, you know, If there's wine being sold, somebody's selling Bordeaux, 
um, it does give you a bit of, um, just as a topical concept, it gives you a bit of pause at the um, relative lack of Bordeaux I see in, say, um, grocery store chains today, as much wine as there is. Um, and it's not because all Bordeaux is expensive, right? If it's got, if it makes all 15% of all of France's wine, TJ, that means a fairly small percentage of that is, you know, the top tier classified growth, highly expensive stuff. There must be a, an enormous volume of everyday wine coming out of this region. Absolutely. And the quality at that level has never been better. So, um, even with, if you look at, uh, you know, taxes and shipping costs and tariffs, et cetera, et cetera, the, you know, everyday Bordeaux is still a great value compared to, you know, say the everyday wines of, of a lot of other wine regions, even domestically. All right. So there are 362 AOC wines in France. So what, just to back up, what is it AOC? It stands for Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. Pardon my French, it's not perfect. Um, and that is the, the French certification system, the Appellation system. And it's the Appellation system that just about all of the world's Appellation systems are based on. And at its heart is this notion of terroir, which is actually uh, gonna be covered in the next episode. But that, that the wine, the grapes in a particular place produce a wine that tastes like this place and like no other place. And uh, they've identified 362 of these appellations around France. Now, Bordeaux has 65 of these, uh, and that's a lot. And that was uh, uh, a shock to me. So I had to, oh, we have a controversy alert, a controversy alert. Apparently, not everybody agrees that there are 65 different appellations. Guilds some. I don't agree because Guildsom doesn't agree, and they, they are absolutely the most important authority in the United States, for sure. Guildsom is one of my go-to resources, and if you guys don't know what Guildsom is, uh, check it out. It's G-U-I-L-D-S-O-M-M dot com. Fantastic website. Um, there's a lot of free stuff, uh, but there's also a subscription that you can get, and it's just, it's just a fantastic source. So. Why the discrepancy? Guildsom says 39 uh, AOC and uh, the CIVB, which we talked about last week, the Conseil Interprofessionnel um, du Vin de Bordeaux, that's the oversee, you know, they oversee everything. They say 65 because I think the discrepancy, we can delve into this a little bit more once we dig down to the appellations, but there are overarching appellations and there are appellations that produce whites, produce reds, uh, whereas Guildsom and many others, not just Guildsom, many other sources will quote a much lower number because they'll count that as one appellation. Whereas Bordeaux is saying, no, this is the appellation for white wines. This is the appellation for red wines. Yes, it's the same geographically, but they are different appellations. So it gets a little bit complex. So a great example would be Pesac Leonian, which has white and red, depending on the chateau as whether they're authorized, et cetera, et cetera, for the crew classification is irrelevant they are allowed to make white and red wine under that AOC name. The French consider them two separate designations and we're like, yeah, whatever, it's one. <laughs> well, you know, and also they, they keep adding appellations. There's new appellations, the Cote de Bordeaux recently. Um, so, you know, you have to, if you're going to keep track of the appellations, you're gonna be updating your website pretty frequently. All right, so I can't uh, continue on without talking about the city of Bordeaux, beautiful city. And it's really, you know, unlike Vienna where there's, you know, an appellation right within the city limits, um, it's not really true for Bordeaux, the city, but you don't have to go very far outside the city limits to start finding yourself in a vineyard real quick. Um, and it's, it's super important because the trade is all here. Um, there's not, it's, everything's done here. Uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. But uh, if you haven't been to Bordeaux, it's a beautiful place. Museums, galleries. And Ron, did you know that it has the highest number of restaurants per capita of any French city? I did not know that, but that makes a lot of sense because they have a tremendous amount of traffic coming through there that doesn't live there. So they, that means they must also have a very high percentage of um, hotel rooms 
per capita. Yes. Um, and I, I got a chance to stay in a couple of them. And it's it's kind of a walkable city too. Not that there's not public transportation there is, but you, you can walk around pretty pretty well and see everything. There's yeah. a great cathedral. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and coming back to your comment earlier about you, you have to leave the city limits to get to the vineyards. I guess the, there should be a delineation there then that, you know, because Chateau Aubryon is surrounded by quote unquote the city, but I guess we're defining that as urban sprawl because the Bordeaux city limits itself end before you get to the Chateau. Is that a good? Um, yeah. Urban sprawl is a great way to put it because um, you know, that wasn't, it, it's now surrounded just like, you know, you see um, the famous uh, Cusina Macul vineyard in, in Chile and in Santiago that it was there and the city kind of grew around it. Um, so that's, that's a fair point. Um, so you, you literally can still, I guess, be in the city of Bordeaux and be in some of the great vineyards of the world. Um, I was kind of thinking more of the, you know, going into some of the, the bigger appellations, but that's a great point. Um, but back to the city, uh, I didn't create this phrase. I didn't come up with this phrase, but somebody told me, and having visited both places, I would kind of agree um, that if you, if you want to go to Paris, but you don't want to spend all that money, go to Bordeaux. You know, it has a lot of the charm, a lot of the architecture, that you'll see in Paris and a lot of the culture and nightlife and of course the gastronomy. Yeah, and if and if you need to, you can just go buy a model of the Eiffel Tower and you've seen it. <laughs> yeah, or you can or you can buy a snow globe uh, model of the Eiffel Tower as my friend did for me for my daughter because that's what she requested. And there was none of that in the city of Bordeaux. So the chateau, we talk about the chateau of Bordeaux, and it's an important part of Bordeaux. Uh, because it's defined as what the estate is generally called, but it has two meanings. It's the estate, but it's also generally the house where the owner's family lives. And that house can be an ornate castle, basically, uh, you know, dating back to aristocratic times. It can be a modern mansion, or it can be a simple farmhouse or simple family house where the family really does live and work. So here we have a couple of examples. We have a beautiful Chateau Pichon Baron in Poyac on the left, and a property I found, I'm not very familiar with them, but Chateau Guadet in Saint-Emilion. Um, you know, just a working, a working house, a working family, and a working vineyard. Um, so there's really everything in between. There's modern architecture, there's, there's these neoclassical types, there's these Gothic, and it's really beautiful. But it's important to know that most chateaux are not the ornate palaces that you see on the left. Most chateaux are quite small. Um, even if they're, you know, beautiful homes, they're, they're not, they're not ostentatious necessarily. I mean, if, if you're going to think about 15% of France's wine coming from here, not everybody that owns a vineyard has the money and the history and the, um, I guess the, the bankroll based on hundreds of years of success. Right. So, uh, and a lot of, a lot of them just are what we would think of. They're, they're wine farmers or farmers that make wine, whichever way you want to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are starting to make money because people are buying your wines, where are you going to invest? Are you going to build this, this uh, new modern palace or are you going to upgrade your winery? So when they do make money, that's where their money's going is to modernize the winery, maybe expand it. And that's, uh, that's the focus, not the house necessarily. They will, however, get around to the house. I promise. <laughs> yes. Well, it's it's funny. Um, I was trying to look for examples of of more uh, straightforward family homes in Bordeaux, and it is hard because everybody's house is really not. I, I, there's nothing I found that I wouldn't go happily stay in, or or if I could talk my family into it, move there. Um, and they're just beautiful, beautiful homes. Every it's a lot of pride, I think in Bordeaux, in the vineyards and in the, in the land and in where people live. So this is a little bit about how the viticultural structure works. And it's, <laughs> ooh, it is confusing. There are so many different organizations involved in the growing um, that uh, it can get a little, a little complex. So there's two basically ways that the the organizations are, are organized. There's the vertical sort of top down, which is like, as you see in the upper left, the Fédération des Grands Vins de Bordeaux, which is a group of um, 
uh, ODGs, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then there's more horizontal organizations, more traditional, like we would think of a co-op. There's wine unions, uh, like you see the saint Emilion Union de Producteur, the Cave de Rosin, the uh, up in the upper right, you see the Organisme de Défense, um, ODG is what they would say in France. And I was very confused about this concept. I said, what is an ODG? What is this thing? And as far as I have sort of settled it in my own mind, it's very similar to a consortio in Italy. It's, it's a group, they are self-policed and they, they, they run things. They decide the rules, they uh, have the rules for production, they can even get into packaging and labeling. And this isn't just for, for wine, it's for lots of products. Just like the AOC itself is not just for wine. There's AOCs for cheeses, there's AOCs for butters, there's AOCs for all kinds of agricultural products. And there are ODGs as well for these, uh, just as there are in Italy. Um, so those will uh, oversee things. Um, so you have a lot, potentially multiple organizations sort of overseeing your, um, your production in your vineyards. And cooperatives, super important in Bordeaux. There's over 2,500 different producers in cooperatives and cooperatives themselves account for about a quarter of the entire wine production. And um, it's, it's extremely important in, in the quality. In, in giving people a financial leg up, in introducing new technology where you might not be able to afford it yourself. You're sharing the knowledge, you're sharing the expertise, you're sharing the technology. You know, it's, it, there's a lot of benefits to the cooperative. And Ron, as you know, co-ops, I don't know if I would say synonymous with, but they didn't, you know, when you hear a wine co-op, you're like, oh, well, that's just a bulk wine producer, you know, that's a low quality. Absolutely not the truth. In, in most places where I've encountered wine co-ops. In fact, the opposite. It's, uh, it's really improved the overall quality of, of everyone's product. Mm -hmm. And there's a, comp there's a friendly competition and a friendly help to be the best. And um, you know, I would say wine co-op, when you hear the term wine cooperative, depending on where you're talking about, but especially in Bordeaux uh, and in places like Italy and, and others, um, I think it's a positive thing. Yeah, I, th I think that we have to disassociate the idea of co-op with a quality designation because there are certainly examples on both ends of the spectrum and a whole lot of people in the middle, right? There are co-ops who are really not interested in very much in quality. And then there are co-ops that are very, very focused on quality. And the other side of it is if it weren't for the co-ops, uh, the everyday Bordeaux would not be a real option in many cases for people who like wine because the co-op helps to um, uh, spread cost across multiple families and multiple growers so they don't all need to have their own winery which is a tremendous investment which you have to recoup through pricing right so there's there's certainly that and i do have a question ready for you if you okay uh, so beth wants to know so the odgs i'll let you pronounce that are only uh, are only overlapping in the three AOC regions mentioned. Uh, I think she's asking basically if that's the only ODG or if that's just one example, but um, I'll let you figure that out. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I just wanted to give um, a sampling of some of these uh, associations. So that is the ODG for those listed, Medoc, Omedoc, and Listrac Medoc, but that is not the only ODG. There are every, every region has its ODGs, every appellation sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of them. They're they're geographically based, and then they oversee the production, the wines, the rules, the regulations for that particular area. Um, so great question. But no, there's there's I don't know how many ODGs there are just for wine, but there's a lot. If you think of the consortia of of Italy, you know, there's Chianti Classico, there's Chianti, then there's you know this and that, and it's very similar and sometimes overlapping. You know, from a larger area to a smaller area. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think I sounds. I think that that's what I thought you meant by it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we're all clear now. So it sounds like we can move on with things. And I was actually just struggling um, with the um, memory banks to come up with a couple of examples of co-ops that would not be necessarily thought of as co-ops, right? That the quality of the wine is really respected 
Um, one in Spain, certainly that comes to mind is Bodegas Por Sal. Mm -hmm. They have 1,100 growers that that supply the grapes for Bodegas Por Sal, which is, you know, highly ranked and and much respected through the world. Um, in in Piedmont, one of the more available uh, Barolo and Barbaresco producers is a co-op that is escaping my mind all of a sudden. You gotta love that on live webinar where you bring something <laughs> up that you cannot talk about, right? The old adage in our exam settings at the master sommelier level, don't bring it up if you can't finish the conversation. Well, I just broke that rule. Uh, I keep wanting to say Vietti, but it's not Vietti. Uh, yes, Purgatorio del Barbaresco. Thank you, yes. Giacomo. I appreciate that. Thank goodness for our audience who knows more than me. Yes! We have an audience that knows more than me. We can quit now. <laughs> I remember um, when I took my certified sommelier exam uh, at the top of the Hub restaurant in Boston, and I was asked a question during my service exam that I just... By me. I just blanked out, and I was thinking, oh, this guy's going to fail me, and it was, it was Mr. Ron Edwards. And he now we share webinars. Yes. So small world we live in, in the wine world. But yeah, there's nothing worse than just drawing a blank. And you're, you're like, I know, I know this. I know, I know this. All right. So let's talk about the trade. We're going to spend a little time on this slide. So I hope you enjoy the art here. This is uh, obviously some time ago. It's not a recent painting. Um, but it, the trade system in Bordeaux is, is tremendously complex. And if you, you really, we could spend a long time. So I'm just going to give you an overview and perhaps uh, later on in this series, we'll, we'll go deep. Um, but it's basically uh, a three tiered system uh, of uh, production here and sales. And it's called uh, La Place de Bordeaux. And the La Place de Bordeaux is not a place or even a place. It's it's an idea. It's just it's where it's the business structure. I thought wrongly now, as you know, uh, for quite some time when I was starting out. I'm like, oh, I gotta go visit this place someday. I gotta go there. I want to see how this works. And there's no there's nowhere to visit. It's just a it's an idea. There's offices, of course, but um, um, but how it works is generally a chateau will make the wine. Um, usually or but not always sometimes bottle it they will often go through an intermediary known as a courtier uh, which we could think of as a broker and there's five main courtier firms in bordeaux right now those courtiers in turn will sell to negociants and uh, negociants um, there's about more than 400 different negociants in bordeaux right now um, they don't always go through a courtier they don't always use this broker. They might, the negociant might deal directly with the chateau. The negociant might buy a tank then and ball it themselves. It's just like in Burgundy, the, the same concept of negociant. They can be uh, simply a distributor or they can be almost a producer in their own right. Um, and so the negociants are then responsible for the sales, the, you know, everything from then on. And this, this came about because Back in the day when you had these ornate palaces being built, it was the aristocracy and they didn't get themselves, you know, busy with trade and sales. This was not their, their thing, you know, so they, the negociants came about to facilitate that hard work for them. They will buy your, your wine from you and then you can have it. Um, the courtier took me a little while to really understand. And it wasn't until I went to Bordeaux and, and met with these people and heard the story about why they're so important. So we already talked about how big Bordeaux is. You have all these producers, thousands of producers over all this huge area. You have over 400 different negociants. Their concern was selling, right? They want to sell the wine. They want to export. They want to sell it to the U.S., the U.K., China, et cetera. Um, the courtier's main uh, mission, they know intimately the vineyards, the growers, they know what the prices are going to be. They, they, they watch the system. So they, they are just a, a really almost indispensable part of the whole trade. Like I said, you don't have to go through them. Um, if you're a negociant or a chateau, you might go direct. And eight, some chateaus even are going around the system now and selling directly to uh, their customers abroad, like wholesalers and imports and stuff like that. But it's, it's not um, 
it's not that common yet, but it's becoming more and more common. Um, but these, these brokers have this intimate understanding of the trade, uh, who's growing what, if you said, I need, um, a couple of tanks of Merlot stat, you know, they'll, they'll call you back in a few hours with three options from all over the right bank, perhaps, um, at different prices so that they are still thriving and still very important because this is such an unmanageable, almost unmanageable area in Appalachia. It's just so huge and there's so much going on. Um, but negotiants, uh, negotiants are super important because what they will do is we have this thing called en primeur, which we'll talk about, uh, as I said, more in depth later on. Um, we, we really dive down to the trade and, and vintages and stuff like that. But en primeur is a way of We'll show you our wine. You can decide what you think. We, we have a price in mind. You can tell us what you think. And then the chateau themselves will get paid for the wine ahead of time. And so they have the cash. So it's a way to get the, the, the money to fund everything. And then the negociants, this will be released. Generally, wine's released in tranches, um, different price levels. So if you buy futures and it goes up, it's like an investment. And Bordeaux is one of the biggest appellations where wine investment uh, takes place that people can actually use this as a, as a, like almost a stock, you know, we'll buy this now and we, it's going to go up in five years and then we can sell and uh, they might not ever possess the wine themselves. They might, and they don't drink it, which I think is a shame. But as I said, the Chateau are now sort of going to people themselves directly. You know, uh, one of my, uh, one of my friends was on a trip to Bordeaux and he was in the Chateau and he wanted to know where they were, you know, who are their big export markets? Who, who are your biggest export markets? And the, <laughs> the owner said, je ne sais pas, I, I don't know. Cause he, they, they don't, they don't, they sell it to Negociant. Negociant takes care of that. They have no idea where the wine's going. And that, um, that can be an issue. It can be a challenge um, as uh, vintages are, you know, getting bigger and there's more competition from other wine regions around the world you have to have maybe a better handle on your market. And so some chateaus are hiring their own sales teams to take care of this, just like a, a basically an importer and they're forming associations. Did that all make sense, Ron? I, it did. It did. And actually I wanted to go all the way back to the beginning when you use the word plus, right? Cause it does sound like place. And I think that a good association for many people in the audience today would be that term they heard when they worked in restaurants, mise en place. Right. So it's sort of like the idea that of things being orderly. Yes, it literally translates to sort of everything in its place, but that's what it's basically doing here, too, is it's all of the business is in place. It's we have our structure. We're on our way. Um, and I think that the changes in Bordeaux all started as far as negotiants are concerned, all started when chateaus began to bottle their own wine. That was the beginning of some people were eventually just going to manage their entire supply chain, right? And it is in their best interest financially to manage their supply chain as long as they can also manage the investment in managing their own supply chain. Um, but not everybody can. And so the role of the negociant is, is, is always going to be there, very similar to, board, to Burgundy. And I also you know, wanted to feedback on the idea of futures being actually a, a possible investment scheme like of the stock market for Bordeaux, even though you see futures and um, early sales in Burgundy, it's just not really possible there. And the main thing is that the production for each of these wineries that you're investing in is so small, that it's really hard to attract the kind of uh, gross dollar margins that you can get out of buying you know, 2,000 cases of first growth Bordeaux. That's just going to give you a very different return than the five cases you can get of Grand Cru out of Burgundy. Mm -hmm. And we do have a question that came in, if you want to entertain it now. Sure. Uh, buying DI from the chateaus going straight to retailers for exclusive or retailer. Okay, let me see here. I'm thinking of Misa Imports in Texas. This is from Beth. Apparently they're buying DI from chateaus going straight to the retailers for exclusives or the retailers that also have an import license of their own for exclusives. And I think that, okay, so she's taking and expanding this model, right? So there are retailers in the US who have um, a cross 
population of buyers own brand where they go over there, they may talk to a courtier, for instance, in France and say, hey, I need, I want to uh, bottle my own label for XYZ retailer and I need, you know, I don't know, 100,000 hectoliters. And he says, okay, or she says, okay, I'll find that for you. Let me get back to you. The other option is you go there very much like Winebow does and you say, I would like to exclusively import your wine. I don't want you to sell it to anybody else in the US, which is not the norm for Bordeaux long-term, right? Most Bordeaux houses have multiple importers in every country. They, they never quite got into this exclusivity thing that other regions did. Um, so, but that is now part of the market. Um, so, you know, Winebow has exclusive Bordeaux brands. Large retailers in the U.S. have written off contracts, right, TJ, of saying, well, I, I'm the only one that's going to buy this wine in the U.S., right? And I'm going to make this deal with you to, to keep my margins where I need to be. Beth, if that's what you were trying to bring up, please give me a yes. Um, although there's not really a question in there, we'll leave TJ to comment on that. Yeah, it's it's changing. Um, when I first started in um, as a wine buyer, you know, if I wanted a, a well-known Bordeaux, I had a few different options. You know, just in Boston, a few different distributors would carry it because you have these different negotiants buying some of the wine and selling it to some people, and nobody had exclusives. And for a long time, that worked. But think about this: if you don't, if you're on the sales side and you don't have an exclusive. You don't feel an ownership over the brand. You don't feel a connection. And, and maybe it's not the most important priority for you anymore. And some of these, you know, the big guys are always going to sell out, right? They're, they're, they're okay. But the next tier down, really good stuff that, you know, people don't know as well. They want that connection in the market. They want someone to, to take their brand and sell it and, and be passionate about it. So that, that is changing quite a bit, this, this you know, direct imports to not just importers and distributors like ourselves and Winebo, but but yes, to big retailers. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an example somewhere out there of even a, a large restaurant group or something having their own. All right, I'm out of questions for the moment. So on we go, yes? Yes. Exports, again, Not we're not gonna go too deep because this is a two hour discussion about exports, but I did want to cover, you know, uh, who's, who's buying this wine and where's it going and why. And um, I don't know what, I think I remember hearing something that like the healthy, uh, the health of a wine region would really be two thirds domestic and, and export the remaining third. I, I don't know, have you heard anything like that, Ron? That ring a bell? No, it doesn't ring a bell. I think the health of a wine region is that they get increasingly large funds for their wines, which <laughs> Bordeaux has definitely done that. Piedmont has chased that down pretty well, and you see how different they are now than they were 50 years ago. And part of that is inherently the export market driving up prices, right? Because uh, a profit's not respected in his own hometown is also true about wine, right? If you grow up with it, you're going to while you're going to value it, you're going to see it kind of the way I see wine now, right? I go to a retailer and I'm always looking at the wine on the shelf relative to what I can buy with my purchase rights through Winebow, right? So it's a very different mental game I'm playing uh, than, than the average consumer. And I think that holds true for these chateaus in France. While they are respected and people want to buy their wines, they're gonna see the pricing a little bit different. Yeah. and. Currently, uh, France, uh, well, Bordeaux is exporting about 44%. The domestic uh, stays about 56%. So they're, they're pretty close to whatever that fictional, I might have imagined that conversation, but it sounds plausible that you want to get, you want to have a strong domestic consumption to keep your base and then you can worry about exports. Um, but exports are very important to Bordeaux and they have been very important. We talked about last uh last time with the history and it's it's always been a, a region that was dependent on its exports first it was england and then it became you know the colonies and and now it's everywhere and the biggest uh the biggest news in bordeaux exports over the last several years has been asia particularly china and hong kong and, and for 2018 again this is the most recent stats i could get so in terms of exports volume the in 2018, the top three markets were China, the USA, and Belgium. 
followed by the UK, um, Germany, Japan, Hong Kong. In exports value, it was Hong Kong, China, and USA, and I think after that is the UK. So you, you start to see a pattern here, and I read that this is not just for Bordeaux, this is for all of France's total wine production. Uh, about half of it is exported to China, the US, and the UK. Half of all their exports are in these three markets. And look what's happened in these three markets over the last few years. We have Brexit in the UK making things uncertain. There's been all these tariff wars in the US, which has hurt sales. China is an up and down um, kind of thing, and, and Hong Kong may become less of a, an important entity over time as it uh, you know, is more control from the mainland China. But it's very, well, I wouldn't say very, it's somewhat precarious now, Ron, because they're so dependent on these three big markets, and they are scrambling to make sure that they're spreading their risk, so to speak, over more, and they're looking for new opportunities all the time. Yeah, this is especially true for the classified growth system because uh, it didn't take a lot of work uh, over the last 50 years. They developed a, a system that pretty much guaranteed it was all sold before it was ever bottled. Um, they could heavily depend on the Asian markets to buy up everything that was considered luxurious and um, of great reputation because it it lent itself to a culture of um, status and gift giving and things like that in the Asian market that was very valuable to the Asian market. And it drove prices up to the point that the US market started to pull back a little bit. So we'll see what happens. There's a certain amount of reality that once wine hits a certain price, you, you're really not gonna see it drop below that. It would be very difficult for instance, for Chateau Margaux to suddenly start charging 35% less just because the market got saggy a little bit. but. I think that they are actively looking for new opportunities in markets that aren't as strong for them to sort of spread out. I think you're totally right. I don't. I don't know exactly what that is yet. Um, all and and we'll see through time, right? I mean, the U.S. for all the problems we've been through in the last 18 months, this is still a giant wine market, and it's only getting better as more people are turned on to wine, right? It was the a giant market even when the first preference for alcoholic beverages was beer first, spirits second, and then wine down at 6%. And now it's wine second, and it's almost tied with beer. So at 22% of the populace or something like that currently, that's a that 22% of 350 million people is a lot of wine drinkers. So if we if we were to move that that just as a philosophical point, if we were to move those first preference drinker to a European wine consumption model, Oh man, how much wine would we sell in the United States? Because uh, we drink like 10% of the per, <laughs> per capita per com consumption or something like that. I don't remember where it is now, but it used to be just minute by comparison, like 70, 90 liters of wine per person per year in uh, Italy up until recent times. And we're at like 15 or something like that. Yeah, and it's important to note too, the relative importance of not just Bordeaux, but of France in the wine world. You know, I remember, you know, one of the first wine books I ever got was Windows on the World, Kevin Zarelli, which is still just one of my favorite books. But early, earliest editions, you know, it's 25, 30 pages of France. Italy's like a page. South America is a page, you know, so France was it. And I don't know if that, if you care to comment i don't know if this was true for you in your early studies you know how much how much of your early studies was just france you know oh it was probably 75 percent of it early on for sure i had that same book it was yeah valuable to me uh, um, I'm, glad, I'm glad to see that that is not the case now and and you do have to put significant time into italy you do have to think about spain and you do have to think about south america and um and i encourage everybody to put in lots of time in greece but that's for another webinar <laughs> that's your that's your passion project is greece um but yeah it's it's uh it's relative importance in the world of wine it's still up there i mean let's let's face it but there's competition from other european countries there's competition from the new world uh and it's just starting all the time i haven't had the opportunity yet to have any of the 
the Chinese red wines from Ningxia that are based on the Bordeaux model. But I, from what I read, some of them are quite good. And we're going to start to see, will we start to see that uh, compete in the world market? I don't know. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting time for Bordeaux in the world of wine. And um, they have not had the best year. Uh, 2019, exports went way up, but a lot of that was stockpiling prior to what, you know, people's fears about Brexit, people's fears about tariffs, which proved to be uh, well-founded and, and exports in 2020 did go, go down quite a bit. We'll see what happens in 2021. And that's our exports slide for now. Any questions on exports, Ron? Well, we don't have any questions up at the moment, but let's uh, let's start by what we're going to do next and uh, see if anybody has any other questions. It's a great time to pop them in the Q&A. Uh, don't wait, because uh, if you wait, we will um, unfortunately not, not see them and it will be too late. Yeah, so our next episode in a couple of weeks, uh, our special, uh, it's not on Valentine's Day, but it will be maybe the most romantic of our episodes. Um, we're going to talk about the concepts of crew and terroir, which are, you know, so important to Bordeaux, so important to France, and uh, really, you know, a lot of practical things that we can say, and there's a lot of nebulous things we can say too. It's it's an art as well as a science. Um, so we're going to delve into that for our next episode, and hopefully we can keep it brief because this, again, these are big concepts we're taking on. Um, by the way, if you Google La Place de Bordeaux. This is what comes up. This behind me and, and in the slide. This is the Place de la Bourse. Um, yeah, but it's not actually the Place de Bourgogne. It is not. And I thought that for a while. I'm like, oh, that's where they do all the deals. All right. So uh, James has a question. Uh, is there a known breakdown of exports to different countries by cost slash quality? I've heard the bulk of higher end Bordeaux wine goes to China, Hong Kong. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's resources out there if you want to Google uh, like LiveX. Um, uh, Jane Anson, who's like the Bordeaux expert, um, she usually puts out some stuff on on the breakdown. Uh, but as far as price, yes, as um, Ron alluded to earlier, the the great gross, uh, the classified gross, were going to Asia, particularly China, in uh, a much higher number than anywhere else, and uh, they got a little dependent on that. And so when that started to quiet down and a lot of that, as Ron said, was they had this tradition of giving gifts and you would give a big status gift. And um, that was outlawed by the government. So you couldn't do that anymore. So, you know, one of the things that would be given was expensive, beautiful red wine from Bordeaux. Um, it sounds crazy that that could move the needle, but it, it did. So in terms of uh, price points, um, I believe that a large number of the upper tier wines are still going to Asia, uh, probably the U.S. and U.K. Um, and we're, uh, when you get down to more uh, of the more everyday appellations, I think it's a little more spread out, although those markets are still important for that. Yeah, based on what you were saying earlier, obviously Belgium must buy a lot of everything. Yeah, well, yeah. Right? That surprised me when I read that. I didn't, I didn't expect oh, that. You know, they get tired of beer eventually in Belgium. <laughs> All right. So um, somebody broke the rules and put a question in the chat window, but I will read it anyway because I'm, I'm trying to be a nice person. So Bordeaux often makes the wine list, but not often the buy the glass program. Why? Well, this is just my opinion, and I'm sure you have a, a, a more informed opinion, Ron. But I have an opinion. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, I already discussed this, and um, the quality of everyday Bordeaux a couple of, I, I want to say a couple of decades ago, two, three decades ago, wasn't great. There was a huge disparity from the top to the bottom in the middle, um, and it, it there was, uh, you know, they've had some scandals with with chemicals and pesticides and herbicides, you know, as I talked about in their first episode, that's completely changed. And we'll dive more into that later on about their commitment to organic and sustainability. Um, but as knowledge has increased in viticulture and in winemaking, and as the climate in general has, you know, climate change for wine regions is sometimes a bonus. And in Bordeaux, 
and Burgundy, for example, it's been mostly a positive so far. Vintages are much more even. And when they're not, they know how to deal with that. So I think that uh, by the glass uh, for, you know, a couple of decades ago, the wines weren't really that great. And I think now, and I think Bordeaux is really trying hard to change this. And I think they're having some success is Bordeaux's not as exciting to the young, younger crowd. They're like, you know, they want to try this, they want to try that. So why do I want to have this old Bordeaux? You know, that it's, but that's, uh, there's a concerted effort to change that and to get younger people to know about Bordeaux and to appreciate Bordeaux. So I hope that we're going to see more Bordeaux by the glass. Uh, but Ron, what do you say? Um, I think that the, the biggest obstacle in the by the glass program is well, let me rephrase. There are two obstacles. The first obstacle is the maturity of the buyer themselves, right? So the restaurant uh, trade before COVID, already before COVID, was rife with ownership that felt like building beverage programs was really straightforward, simple stuff, and anyone can do it. And so they would just say to some manager or some young server that's being promoted that isn't the general manager here, you're in charge of the wine program. And um, what you get in that result is a lack of comfort level with experimentation because they ha- you also have to have the chops to go out and sell it. And the easy button in the buy the glass programs universally is to whatever the customer is automatically going to ask for is what I should put on my buy the glass program because if I don't have it, they're going to be disappointed. It's a next level conversation to say, well, my customer is asking for Cabernet Sauvignon. Great offer one from California and one from Bordeaux. They're both Cabernet Sauvignon. They're both the same price. Or maybe, as I used to do, the California Cabernet would be $2 more a glass than some really great Petit Chateau Bordeaux, which was probably sitting in the warehouse a little extra long and is probably three vintage older, ready to drink. That was my scheme. It's a little bit of a a maturity issue because when I was a young buyer, I didn't do that because I didn't know to do it. And so the biggest, the biggest obstacle is our side of the industry helping young buyers move past the idea that I have to give them Cabernet Sauvignon on the label in order to sell it as Cabernet Sauvignon on the buy the glass list. And, and really all you have to do is tell them it's Cabernet Sauvignon on the buy the glass list and buy one of the chateaus that you can pronounce without, you know, French um, being your native language so that customer is comfortable. Uh, but those are two big obstacles. If they weren't big obstacles, you would find out, you would see more Bordeaux by the glass in restaurants. Um, it's, it's, it's the easy button. We have another question from Katerina, and this was, I, I like this one a lot. Uh, what would you recommend to try if I wanted to experience and compare Bordeaux across several price points? Hmm. Are you asking different uh, appellations or different tiers? I think she's asking different experientials, probably the idea of price points. Okay. I, think, I think this is rooted in the idea of, if I'm going to spend my hard earned dollars, I'd like to trust that I'm getting the experience I'm supposed to get, right? So um, you know, maybe we can come up with, between the two of us, some actual producer names to go out and look for that give you the quote unquote Thursday night Bordeaux experience. <laughs> Uh, mm, I like my neighbors. I'll share this with them experience um, and the special occasion experience. Yeah, it was a couple things. First, just to say one more thing about that last question about by the glass. And this is also something I think that's relevant to this question is white Bordeaux. You know, most Bordeaux is red and most of that is Merlot. Um, But there's some really fantastic white wines. And if you go to something like a tasting, a trade tasting like the Union de Grand Cru de Bordeaux, you can taste some of the most amazing classified growth reds, uh, some of whom also produce whites. And the reds are great. And they're $80 or $100 or $150 a bottle retail. And you taste their whites and their whites are great. And they're $20 retail or $25 retail. Mm -hmm. Just amazing value. And people, there's a lot to discover there. Um, But as far as more to the second question here, um, I think you look for, we try a bunch of different things. Um, there's not 
as much value uh, from left bank appellations because you, you, most of that's classified growth. So it's hard to find uh, really good Thursday night wines unless you're talking about uh, what we have is a second wine or even a third wine. So a Chateau has their Grand Vin and then they'll produce a second wine mm -hmm. and sometimes even a third wine. Like for example, Ron, for us, uh, 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 we have Segla from, mm -hmm. you know, it's a second wine and we have it exclusive and it's, it's beautiful. And it's, mm -hmm. you're getting the product of a great Chateau at, um, I don't know if it's an everyday price, but it's a much more affordable price than the Grand Vin. Yeah, and here's another couple of options. Uh, Chateau Peyrat. Uh, P E Y R A T, Katerina, if you want to watch that, write, write that down is Grave Blanc and Grave Rouge. And um, the 17 vintage sells for about, about $25, $26 a bottle retail, depending on where you're buying it. And it's a really good bottle of wine. I have often bought it and, and had it here at home. Um, and there's, uh, I was trying, I was looking up in our price point, our price book here in, in Virginia, just because when I'm live, the names don't always come immediately to me. <laughs> so uh, I'll get back to you on another recommendation unless uh, TJ can come. Well, I'm thinking of the one that, one of the items that we exclusive that comes in that's like, you know, um, in that 15, under $20 range, I guess. Yeah, we have a, we have a few. We have, uh, you know, thinking of Chateau Fontanillo. Yes, it's a really great value, um, and you know, so that's an ultra de mer appellation, which is mm -hmm. between two C. So that's a lot of white wines there. Yep, and that um, one would be about seventeen, eighteen dollars retail. In and uh, in general, I think when you look in the right bank, you know, not the big, tiny, you know, huge producers in Pomerol and uh, Chateau Osson or something in Saint Emilion, but. Uh, there's really good value in Cinque de Million. And then when you get into the satellites, we have some really good stuff from the satellites, Ron, from Lalonde, yeah. from Moral, and, yeah. um, and the satellites of Cinque de Million. They're just not as well known, and they, consequently the prices are much, much better, and they're, and they're fantastic. Yeah, oh, that's the one I couldn't think of. Chateau Paranchere, uh, P-A-R-E-N-C-H-E-R-E. -E. Um, you know, the Bordeaux Superior is uh, 1999. Retail, usually usually quite delicious. Uh, we already mentioned Fontenil. Uh, Chateau Beausite um, mm. is a beautiful Santa Steph wine that you brought up. That, you know, I yeah, just that had that actually uh, compared it. Where it? Now that one's your, for most people, this is a special occasion wine. You know, you're talking about 50-ish, 52, $55 retail. Um, so those those are some, some options for you. Um, and then, you know, one of, and then after that, you have to depend on, you know, what experience are you looking for, right? <laughs> the, are you looking for one of those classified growth style experiences, in which case they just cost what they cost. And, you, and I recommend getting friends together and investing together um, so that you, you're spreading out the experience of a 250 or 300 or 400 or $500 bottle of wine. Uh, so that you have the uh, the experience. My other favorite methodology is cozying up and making friends with collectors who like to share with people who appreciate wine. That that really works great. How do you do that? Just nice to people in restaurants. Usually, <laughs> uh, most of the uh, most of the classified growth I've ever tried was at the hands of someone who was a generous collector who felt like um, they would like to share a taste of it with me. So yeah, and you, you know. I don't think, I don't know where we are all at right now, but you're probably not too far from a very good retail store. And they would, I'm sure, enjoy if you went in and said, I'm looking for some good value Bordeaux. What do you have? Or if they say, we don't have any, then find the next retail store. All right, TJ, unless you've got other uh, essential elements of this conversation, the questions have been answered. The folks are... Uh, heading off into their life and it's probably time for us to say goodbye. It is. And I want to say one thing for those who are interested in, in you know, stuff like buy the glass programs and how to uh, build a wine program and hospitality. There is another webinar series called pre-shift, which you can catch up with, um, which is uh, Ron Edwards sharing some of his wisdom from his years in hospitality. And we have a number of episodes that you can watch on our YouTube channel 
and they are uh, also on Tuesdays, but every other Tuesday. So yep. um, you should probably get invites for that, and probably some of you have seen it. So thank uh, you for that plug of my webinar. I appreciate that. And by the way, when we sign off, we'll take this recording off to YouTube once we've edited it a little bit, and it will be found on the playlist labeled The Bordeaux Show. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.